this is the best film that you cannot get your head around. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome back to We Speak Cinema. Um, I am Peter. This is Iwan. Yes. And today we are discussing Federico Fellini's Eight and a Half. What, what is there to say? Like, I feel like Eight and a Half just has its own... You don't have to say anything after it. It's Eight and a Half. Oh, after seeing this? Yeah, you just... If you see this in the theater, if you see this in the compounds of your home, once you see this, you're like, okay, uh, I have to take a break <laughs> from, like, life. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's one of the most uh, inspirational films for directors working today. Yeah. For sure. I think... Uh, this, this and Day for Night. From yeah. Truffaut. Yeah, so I was actually going to say, uh, bring that up, because... I think that this film is the best uh, film that looks at an internal battle of a director or what's going on internally in a director's mind. In, uh, regards, they, to, in regards to his to his film? In regards to, yeah, like Eight and a Half is the best made film about a director who's battling, who, what, what an, what's going on in the inside of a director's mind, basically. Mm -hmm. Because for Day for Night, um, it's kind of more objective. Like you're just watching the process, I feel like, of how they're making a film. Yeah, from day for night. I mean, we're not gonna talk about it that much, but just because I brought it up. Um, you are not in the director's shoes. You're not talking, you're, you're, not from, you're not seeing this from a director's perspective. You're not following the director as you're following um, um, the director in eight and a half. Right. You are placed within the set. You're introduced to the director, to the thoughts of the director, and then you're just left off on the set with, and then you're introduced to different actors on mm -hmm. the set and what's their sort of life. So it's sort of, the day for night is sort of a communal thing about about uh, filmmaking, while Eight and a Half, I, I think Fellini's idea about Eight and a Half was more egocentric on this guy's life. On it's, Basically, it's a biography of himself, if mm -hmm. you really about it yeah yeah absolutely um and i just i want to say that the lead actor of eight and a half uh Marcelo is, Mastriani. Yeah. yeah Marcelo Mastriani, um he carries this film he oh, yeah. is the reason that you have this sort of affection and understanding and empathy for this character he looks so like badass by the way like with the sunglasses and everything he looks oh, like I, a director i love it when um this is towards the end of the film, and this is uh, we are approaching the the moment when you are you are tr you as the viewer are understanding that he as it he's at peace with his wife, and with his, with his mistress, and he's just sitting there. Yeah. Uh, and the mistress comes in and and she sits down at the table, and then his wife go his wife goes to the mistress, and they sit together, and the mistress the mistress waves, and he's like sitting there rocking. In yeah. Like a, Suit and the sunglasses on, oh, man. It's it's I, it's it, awesome. It's um, so just, just just to have some like um, cr I, not chronological order, but some sort of order to this. Um, I, I kind of wrote down a couple things that I wanted to talk about about this film. Please. So uh, no, let, let's make it uh, clear to to those who are watching. I've seen this film uh, last summer when you saw it for the first time. Yeah, I seen uh, this film because I, I I wanted to like it. I didn't like it the first time. I get it. I get it. I gave it a three and a half, and then I watched it two more times, and then I gave it a five. And you watched it last <laughs> year. I watched it last year and didn't even rate it because I was so confused. The amount of times that I paused the movie, I didn't have a clear understanding of what I was watching. That's the thing about there are certain films in life which they ought not to be paused during. Mm -hmm. the and this is uh, this is one. Of this them. is definitely one of them because if you pause this film too many times, you will be lost. You will not understand what's going on. Because you're pausing it and then you're going to the bathroom, coming back again, uh, or you're being called by whatnot on like the phone or your parents or whoever, mm -hmm. and you're like disturbed, and then you come yeah, back ten minutes later. Or, and especially like if someone yeah. calls you while you're watching this movie, and you have to pause, or it's just ridiculous. Um, yeah. So the first time I watched this movie. Um, I, uh, this, uh, I had seen La Strada, which I really liked. And then I only saw this one, I believe, um, before yeah. we did this week of Fellini. And then you, and yeah, then you you've, you've seen Amacord last. I have seen Amacord, yeah. So Fellini wasn't really like, um, I hadn't found the correct 
film or a couple of films from Fellini that I really, really enjoyed. And this time around, I enjoyed it. I thought the performance was great from uh, for Gu the character of Guido. Yeah. Um, yeah, so let me just get into this. Um, so the opening scene. I think that the opening scene is revolutionary. To say phenomenal. That. Phenomenal. Yeah. It is, you're sitting in traffic with our main character, and it, it, it gives almost a very creepy vibe because it's yeah. it's giving you pans of people sitting in their cars and they're just staring at this guy and, and he's being trapped in the car yeah like not moving i mean it opens up like a horror film which is very unique because it already shows you how what he's we, what we later come to find out that he's dreaming about yeah and and then and then in the same sequence it's that beautiful shot i, I believe one of those uh first shots of the film Please say what I'm. I, I hope you're gonna say what I think you're gonna say. Of when when he gets out of the car and he climbs on the car and he's just doing this. Yeah. He's mm -hmm. exiting the tunnel and the light yeah. going in and you just see the shadow and the outline of his uh, what uh, and his uh, of his figure. Incredible shot. It's an incredible shot, and not only is that an incredible shot, but when they're trying to pull him down. Yeah. From the sky. That's. And you have, um, I'm not even kidding. I don't know how they did it. And I don't want you to tell me how they did it because I want it to remain a mystery. It looks incredible. I mean, I kind of would know how they did it, even though I'm not entirely sure. I rather, I rather keep it, you know, anon anonymous. Magic, for just, a just, just keep it a movie magic. Yeah. Right. Um, so that in itself is great. And then he wakes up from the dream, yeah. and I exactly. love that scene. I exactly, I love that scene when he wakes up, and they're yeah. opening the curtains. And you're kind of coming back to reality about mm -hmm. his life and who he is. And it's it's just phenomenal. Yeah. I want to say, I think this movie shines best, or shines most, through the flashback sequences and, mm -hmm. and his dreamlike states. For example, when right. he sees his parents. Yes. At the cemetery. And, and, yes. It's very moving. Um, it's eerie. It's eerie as well because just, you know they're dead and then... He goes to the cemetery, or, or or he's like thinking of his parents, and he imagines himself being in the cemetery talking to them. And um, it's interesting how the father leaves off, if I remember yeah. correctly. And, yes, he uh, does. Yeah. He's yelling after the after after his father is like, well, "Why are you going? Where are you going?" Mm -hmm. um, it's again this. I, I I I'm not a Fellini expert. I, I don't know much about his life, but I think. He had a difficult time with his father. Um, mm -hmm. I do know that Fellini, along with his brother, who plays in Ivi Taglioni, Ricardo, yeah. will, well, they look alike. Um, they both attended Catholic school, just like mm -hmm. we see in this film, boarding school. Yeah. And just like we see in this film, Fellini used to sneak out of the school while dressed in um, the school uniform and just go around and amuse himself. Yeah. Um, um, I, I think that those those moments are what really make this film um, special. And it, it, like just when he goes, um, <laughs> when he uh, goes out with um, is that I, I don't want to I don't want to mess up the movies. I just want to make sure that this is the same yeah. film. Is it is it in this film where he goes out to the, with a woman who sings or dances, who dances for? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's on the beach. Yeah, yeah. That's when he's a younger child, right? Yeah, that's, that's when he's childhood. in the boarding school. That's when he's on boarding in the boarding school, and then the priests find out, and there's that 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 shot of the priest running, running on the beach after him, and he's running away from them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah and the 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 what is it? Ana Misi Masa or something like that. Ana Misi Masa. Yeah, when when it's like, and that's a a spell of some sort with the kids when they're in bed. Yeah, it's a yeah, it's a kid, it's a kids play, but. You know, when you watch the scene, when when the the magic, not the magic dude, the magician, um, guesses exactly that that phrase. Yeah. You're like, how do they do it? Because this is supposed to be real life. This is not supposed to mm -hmm. be. And that adds what the flashback does there is that it it reinforces the fact that it's uh, it's not something that the guy could have known. You know, we're going back into Guido's memory. Yeah. To see what that phrase meant that this guy guessed. Right. 
Um, I know. I just, I just think that that's incredible. Um, I, my favorite scene from the movie is when he's in the hotel, I believe, and everyone is trying to ask him questions. Yes. The, yeah, yeah. And, and he's like, uh, it's it's his uh, screenwriter, the uh, the producer, uh, the uh, pro uh, what the the, pro the the no the producers or the agents of the other actors. They're just yeah forming on him, and then he has the meeting with the uh, with the bishops with the with the Catholic bishops. Yes. Yeah. I, I mean that for me that scene is, is the best in the film because uh it, it the dialogue the dialogue is very snappy. So like some guy comes up to him and he starts he wants to talk to Guido, but Guido grabs another guy and makes up a sentence and he goes, Oh, by the way, we have to do and then he just cuts off and he goes, Uh, I just really didn't want to talk to that guy. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. On. and yeah. it's that and it's that type of dialogue. Um, and character development that makes that scene perfect for me. I think that's a perfect scene. Um, I'll tell you what, my, I think my favorite scene in the whole film, because it's funny, well, mm -hmm. there are two scenes. Uh, it's the one when, when he allegedly comes home and he, is that, is that imagine, uh, is that dream sequence when he's imagining or he's dreaming that he's in the custody of all his mistresses and all of, all of his actors who are women and yes. his wife and how they're all collaborating with one another and they're taking care of him. Uh, first and foremost, it's funny because the way he portrays it and the way that he's so benevolent and uh, and also how Fellini sort of portraying the woman in this scene and how, I don't, I don't know if Fellini wanted to show us in the dreamlike sequence, um, hidden traits of the woman that we are presented with within the film. I'm not sure about that. Um, yeah. You know, and then the second scene, which I love, is when uh, it's the end, it's towards the very end, he goes to the set because mm -hmm. it's, it's um, he has an interview day and he's being asked so many questions and he's not responding to those questions because he's he's thinking, he's, in, he's thinking. And then we all, we only see, uh, those uh, very fast cuts within the within that within that period, mm -hmm. and when he sits down and he starts talking to himself and talking. To, I, I'm not entirely sure. I don't remember quite exactly what he's saying, uh, but he's talking about you know life and what it, what it means. And then he goes under the table, and you can't when you f see the first time he takes out a gun and he shoots himself. It's like you're like, uh, did he just die? Yeah, you know what? When I watched it the second time, I I knew that he doesn't die. But it still brought up the question. He shot himself, and like I'm like, no, he he doesn't die here. No, no. no. Well, it's what this is why I love the scene. The scene because uh, it wraps the film so nicely if you can dissect it. Mm -hmm. um, because the scene is trying to imply that the old Guido, or the Guido that has been troubling his mind, is like I'm talking about. There are two Guido. This is what I'm. That that this is what Fellini is inferring. There are two Guidos. One who's trying to be normal, and he's trying to make this film, and he's trying to have a good uh, uh, life with his wife and life in general. And then it's the other Guido, who is not letting the first Guido go away. He's attached to the memories of his parents, attached to the memory of his. Uh, it's basically memories. Yeah. And, and 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 the whole idea of him killing himself is basically him killing his ego. He's past ego. And He's you know what? That doesn't happen that time. It happens again. I don't remember if you can think of which scene it is off the top of your head. Where Wait, after he shoots himself? No, it's before he shoots himself. There's another scene where it is implied that he wants to kill himself or he wants to kill his alter ego. Oh, you mean and the scene when he's in the theater and he imagines his producer being hanged? Yes. Well, no, I don't know. Okay, that scene. <laughs> when I first saw it, I was like, I have to be, I, I'm so bad. Uh, I laughed out loud. <laughs> yeah, you know, know. They're watching, you know they're, watch, they're watching performances on the stage. And then, you know, we, ha we have sort of those things, a what if. Yeah. And then, you know, it's not true. But I don't think that was implied. I think, uh, I think, no, this is the only scene. When, when yeah, so because I thought that that was, I thought that that was Guido, um, thinking about hanging himself. I didn't know that that was the producer. Oh, no, because if, if, if he would have thought of hanging himself, then he we would actually see him hanging himself. And we'll, right. we'll see some parts indicating that he's up there. 
which yeah, but it clearly, yeah. I mean, it clearly demonstrates that somebody just wants to end their life through this entire process. That, well, that or, or, or Guido wants to end somebody's life because exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, right. But this last scene, it's so great because then the whole perspective of Guido changes. He doesn't want to do the film anymore. But and then the very last scene when he's uh, when we see the circus and we hear the circus, the fa the famous circus uh, music, and then everybody's going around and holding hands. And him joining the the crowd, it's um, it's the idea that Guido has, in a way, forgiven himself, like forgiven about his past. He has moved on, and he's reconciled with himself, with the person who he is. Uh, maybe Fellini was trying to also convey certain stuff that he hasn't given us. Maybe he has done something very horrible during his life, but we don't know, and that's why he has to go through this whole process imaginary killing his 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 ego joining the circus of life and just enjoying it and just be part of it mm -hmm. you know, give i really it. i really like your um you know your thing about the two guidos i think that that's very um important to understand because if you if you really cut the film at the very last sequence and you analyze the film way before he shoots himself and then after that you, there are two different guidos yeah, yeah two different they guidos are. Different perspectives and whatnot, uh, you know. That's so crazy, and that that whole uh, that whole um, from the mo I think the last forty minutes or so of this film is perfect. I'm I was not I not that I was ever bored in the movie, but I didn't pause it. I enjoyed every single thing that I was watching from the moment that he comes through the door in his dream fantasy sequence with the women, to him going into the theater to watch the um, what do you call it, the screen yeah. tests. The screen test, the the runs, yeah. The screen test uh, of the of the actresses, all the way up until the end, where he actually goes to the set, yeah. and and he's you know with the paparazzi. Apparently, this film created paparazzi. The paparazzi, yeah. Either yeah. this one or La Dolce Vita. Uh, your conclusion remarks. What? Yeah. Final remarks about the film, and then uh, obviously the rating that we are <laughs> eagerly awaiting. I know everyone is just so excited to hear my rating. Um. I always think, and we always say this to each other, the more you talk about a film like we're doing now, the more you appreciate it and the more you want to watch it again. For me, um, I prefer, like if I, if you told me, you know, to pick a Fellini film and that's your favorite or you will keep that forever, it's going to be Knights of Kiberia for me. Right. I, I, there's, I have a greater want to go watch that movie back and, and, and revisit her story. Even though, uh, even though uh, it's a much sadder story than Eight and a Half, yeah, and and I think La Strada as well. If you really think about it, La Strada, La Strada is, is sad though. La Strada is sad. La Strada is depressing, but I think Night of Cabiria actually beats the depressing stuff. Um, I'm not a depressed. I'm not a depressed person. I just really like Night of Cabiria. Neither am I. Neither am I. Night of Cabiria is incredible. I'm, uh, uh, it's Knights of Kiberia. If you guys are just um, seeing this film and you don't like it, or you've seen any other Fellini film, maybe late, later Fellini, like l after Amacord, and you don't like it, go to his early stuff. Go to Evi Taglioni. Go to La Strada. Go to Knights of Kiberia. Um, yeah, it's incredible. I mean, this entire week I, we've been doing um, Fellini, and I, I really liked Evi Taglioni. I love. Um, Knights of Kiberia. I do enjoy and I appreciate eight and a half. Um, my rating for this film is yes. a four. Yeah. It's a four out of five because a five out of five for me is something that's perfect. I can watch it whenever. Um, and I, it's something that I completely love. And it's not a four and a half just because I don't, I've seen it twice and it's more so uh, a film that you want to watch for Mm, I don't want to say film school, but it has that type of energy to it where uh, I'm not really drawn to see Guido um, uncovering himself again and realizing what this director process is like. Well, yeah, I, I agree. But um, in regards what to the you? Rating, what do you think? It's a masterpiece. In my opinion, it's a masterpiece because, again, I see it from my perspective of the two mm -hmm. Guidos, from a more of a psychological perspective, how yeah. a person has to go through life being miserable up to the point where he wants to take his own life, but then he just realizes that he only has to do is kill his old ego 
just kill off the the stuff that that is trying to kill him, and then he'll be free. Um, I love this film, and Macho Mastroianni, and also why I love this film is it's because it's Macho Mastroianni. This uh, one of my I favorite high-end uh, actors. Um, no, I'm I'm not hating on this movie. I just no I no no no. I we understand. <laughs> we eight and a half lovers. We understand the fact that this is the best film that you cannot get your head around. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But um, I'm telling you this: once you're gonna see this um, the third time, mm -hmm. I think your rating is gonna go up because, mm -hmm. just like a Tarkovsky film, I'm telling you this from my experience: unless you see it more than twice or three times, mm -hmm. you won't you won't get it at the first. If you get it the first time, you're a genius. Like your IQ is like 250. So for this time, just so I have a record of it, how I feel about this movie is a four yeah. out of five, and the last 40 minutes are incredible, and the opening sequence. It's the middle part for me that is a little um, difficult to get through. It's just not, for me, it's not completely uh, entertaining, let's put it that way. It doesn't grab my attention. Um, that's what I have to say about that. Yeah. Um, any, any last remarks before we end the video? My last remarks are Fellini, Mastroianni, Eight and a half. Yeah. Fellini is a yes. Fellini is a must. Um, man, this film, if you haven't seen this film, go check it out. Go check it out. <laughs> go check it out. <laughs> oh my gosh. Objectively and subjectively, I think we both agree. Fellini is better than Godard. I said it. Dude, you can't even you can't even compare them. It's like sacrilege. It's still <laughs> sacrilege. I love that. Oh my god, that's like the quote of the video. Because it is. It's filled sacrilege. How 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 can you? This is a perfect how, masterpiece. How could you? How could you? Um, and again, you want to see this film? Um, should you blind buy this? Would you recommend blind buying this? I, I recommend blind buying it, but you're, in order to understand it, like you said, you're going to have to watch it like three or four times. I'll blind buy this um, anytime, any day. And I'll recommend any day of the week, any, any year. Day. I'm recommending this film. Who's, who wants to become a filmmaker or who is interested in filmmaking uh, and just wants to see a glimpse of what a director's life is. Maybe it's not going to be this crazy, but you this get film did it best. Yes, it did. Yes, it did. Yeah. That's why it's so highly praised is because this film did it best. Yeah. Truffaut tried. Um, did Godard make one about a director? Contempt. Some... Contempt. Yes. Oh, Lord. Um, yeah. Uh, this is the best one. Uh, so go check it out, like we said. Go check it out. Um, we're going to leave you guys uh, with your thoughts about this film. Please yeah. put in the comments. Uh, subscribe why the heck not would you not subscribe to this channel we know our video our videos may be long but our conversations are golden and our content is massive yeah yeah or great so, whatever. um we're gonna see you the next week probably yep. yeah For next sure. week uh we're talking about another film so any anyway guys um take care uh I'll, we'll see you in the next video you know, and uh, as we said again, <laughs> um, please go and please go watch Eight and a Half from uh, Criterion, and only the Criterion one. Well, in regards to the rating stuff, I think this is this is in regards. I'm saying too much in regards. Um, 